thank you all very much. Thank you, Iowa. It is great to be here. Let me first, because family is first, and for Rick Santorum. Let me introduce my wife, Karen, who, along with, well, you see five of our seven children behind us, along with uh, our, our children, came to Iowa three weeks ago. We came three weeks ago, and people said, well, you know, it's nice that Rick is coming. It's sort of a sideshow. No one really thought we were going to do much. No one really thought we were going to have much of, a, uh, of an impact on what was going to go happen in the next three weeks. But thanks to the great work of my wife, Karen, who I will introduce to you right now, and, and, and these five children. How many people have got calls from my kids over the last three weeks, huh? They've been on the phones. They've been traveling around the state. We did 50 cities around the state of Iowa in 14 days, from Strawberry Point to Council Bluffs to Rock Rapids to Fort Madison. We went to all four corners of the state of Iowa. One of the uh, commentators uh, called our campaign the Ring of Fire campaign. And we wanted to make sure all of Iowa was heard from and that all of Iowa got a chance to get to meet at least one of the candidates, to sit in their libraries and in their living rooms, to talk to them, to listen to them, because that's where the great wisdom is in America. And that's what leaders, leaders need to do more of, is to go out and listen to the people and then answer their questions, be accountable to them. And that's what I did. 68 counties later, we have come here to do something important. We have come here, all of you, have come here to say that the folks in Washington, the people in the boardrooms of New York and in the media centers of Atlanta and New York, they are not the ones who are going to choose the next Republican nominee for president. You are going to choose the next Republican nominee for president. And what the people of Iowa have said to me is they want someone who they can trust is going to say what they're going to do and do what they're going to say. Has a positive vision for the future of this country because there is a positive future for this country. If we do what our founders did, believe in the American people, believe in the goodness of the American people, free people, who government says yes, like in our Declaration of Independence, which founded this great country, transformed the world because for the first time in the history of the world, we had governments that were not run from the top down, not where you had the divine right of kings, where people were given, uh, the king was given rights by God and then spread the wealth around. No, our founders believed in a country where we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And if it was that belief in free people that transformed the world, for the first time, we said we were going to have a government whose job under this Constitution was limited to protecting life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, many people have said the social issues are not important in this campaign. Well, I've gone out and talked about all the issues. Yes, even the social issues, as you saw last on Thursday night. I will not back down on the sanctity of life and the, and the integrity of the American family. But what people of Iowa recognize is America is a moral enterprise. Our founders understood that for the Constitution to work, it had to be based on something deeper, something grounded. Our rights came from a creator, and the creator has rules. Nature and nature's God, that was another phrase in the Declaration of Independence. They understood that through reason and through faith, we could build a strong country from the ground up based on a moral society. John Adams said our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. That is the mission of America. And to suggest as a Republican Party that we can be a party about just tax cuts and spending cuts and not about strong families and strong faith and strong faith communities 
you don't understand Iowa, and you don't understand America. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you saw from the debate the other night, this campaign is about scratching and clawing for every little bit of recognition we can get. I had to wave my hand and ask for recognition. This is the little engine that could campaign. They told us we had no chance just not to pay attention. And all they did, all the press does, is write about these shiny engines that keep coming by, or, or maybe, maybe we'll come by and help. Maybe we'll hitch up and start working hard. We didn't wait around. We started working hard. We started going out and have been to Iowa more than any other candidate, been to New Hampshire more than any other candidate, been to South Carolina more than any other candidate. Why? Because I want to be accountable to you, and I want the people who are going to make the decision, who are going to have the first cut of narrowing this field and selecting a president, to get a chance to look me in the eye, to kick my shins in the tires, and hear from me exactly my vision for this country and answer your questions. Today is an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to strike a blow for the people of the heartland. This is a heartland campaign, not just about Wall Street, but about all the issues you care about, from national security, as you heard me talk about on Thursday night, to moral and cultural issues, yes, to getting this economy going. And even that, look at the plan I've put forward. It's about the heartland. It's about energy independence and using the resources here in Iowa, the resources in Pennsylvania, the resources in Alaska and offshore to create an energy security for this country that is desperately needed if we're going to fight radical Islam. I grew up in a little steel town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My grandfather, when he came to this country, came to a little town right outside of Somerset, Pennsylvania, where I announced for president. And he came to this country because he wanted to be free, and he believed in the goodness of America, an America that believed in him. America that believed in him and what he could do to provide for himself and his family and the God he served. And for 30 years, he clawed his way for my freedom in the deep mines of western Pennsylvania till he was 72 years old, mining coal in the deep mines. I'm here today standing on his shoulders because I believe right now this country is in jeopardy of losing its freedom. It's in jeopardy because of one man and one bill, Obamacare. <laughs> Obamacare is the single greatest threat to one generation's charge of handing this country off to the next generation, freer, safer, and more prosperous. Margaret Thatcher, when she left the Prime Ministership of England, said she was never able to accomplish what Ronald Reagan accomplished, never able to turn the tides of socialism, and that's what we're talking about here, never able to turn it back in Britain like Reagan was. What Reagan did in getting Americans to believe in themselves, not some government official to take care of them. But what Thatcher said, she was never able to turn it around, and she's pegged it right on the British national health care system. I was in the green room at Fox just a couple of days before the vote on Obamacare. They decided to jam it down the throats of the American public. And I was with Juan Williams. And I said to Juan, what are you doing? You guys are committing political suicide by forcing this down the throats of the American public when they don't want it. And he said, well, let me tell you what the Obama administration told me. Quote, we believe, Obama, we believe that Americans love entitlements. And once we get them hooked on this entitlement, they will never let it go. Just imagine just a couple weeks ago what Barack Obama did when his back was against the wall and he was being pushed by House and Senate Republicans for a debt ceiling increase with cutting spending. What was his first move? Well, just like in basketball, it's to the left. 
His first move was to get in front of a national audience and tell the people who were dependent on the federal government that they were not going to get their Social Security checks, that they were not going to get their veterans' benefits, that they were not going to get their Social, they were not going to get their Medicare benefits. They have the hook, and at the time they need to, they pull the string. Now with Obamacare, everyone is a mannequin. Everyone is a puppet, having attached to Washington, D.C., and being able to be pulled in the way that Washington wants you to be pulled. Not on my watch. You have an opportunity in this race to take someone who the national media is not paying a lot of attention to. Maybe it's because in my electoral history, I defeated three Democratic incumbents, twice for the Congress, twice for the Congress in a 60 and 70 percent Democratic district, and once in the state of Pennsylvania, in a state that Republicans haven't won since 1988, I went up against an incumbent Democratic senator whose campaign was, was managed by a couple of guys who just managed a pretty successful campaign for president back in 1992. James Carville and Paul Begala, and I beat them. In fact, one of my proudest political accomplishments in James Carville's book, he lists his five most hated Republicans, and I am number three on that list. And maybe it's because when I got to Congress, I did what I said. I was part of the Gang of Seven, along with Jim Nussel who cleaned out the House bank and sent three members of Congress to jail. Maybe it was because I fought, I fought for welfare reform and is the only one on this stage today or on that stage the other night who actually authored a bill, managed it on the floor of the United States Senate, got bipartisan support in the Senate, got a Democratic president to sign it that ended a federal entitlement called welfare reform, and it transformed society. Maybe it's because I'm someone who says to the people of this country who care about the sanctity of human life and the integrity of the family that I will not just give lip service. I will stand on the floor of the Senate, and I will stand in the Oval Office, and I will fight for life because I did it for 12 years in the United States Senate and got bipartisan support on three major bills to pass pro-life initiatives, the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, my bill, the Born Alive Infant Protection Act, my bill, and the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, I led the fight. That is not just do it, saying, it's doing. You have an opportunity here today to send a message, to send a message that Iowa doesn't want what New York and Washington and the rest of the elite media want, that Iowa wants a conservative that can win and can govern this country consistent with our Founders' vision and our Constitution. Thank you, and God bless you.